thing over to the side here. If I could get rid of that, it would be nice. So I can make it bigger so you can see it on the projector. All right, well, anywho. Um, I don't know, I might be able to accomplish it this way. Is that getting readable to you folks out there? Hello, hello? Getting readable? Oh, there we go. Can't get any bigger on my screen, so, oh yeah, that's nice. All right, so. Um, what is that a definition of? Naturally occurring organic or inorganic consolidated aggregate. Yeah, a rock. All right. Arguably, you could say that could be a sheet. We do have a lot of inorganic content in us, right? But uh, but no, in context, of course, this is uh, the definition of a rock. And you guys are welcome. Uh, I didn't make you have to write this as much for me as it was for you, in all honesty. But um, so that's the back here, and I'm grade these, and then you guys get all antsy because you don't know how many points you got on the test, and so on and so forth. So it's just in everybody's best interest that uh, this turned into a multiple guess question. All right, we warned you this bugger was coming. And as I said, I, as I promised, I did leave a few placeholders. Uh, it's too small, I'm sure, for you guys to see out there. You have igneous rock in place. You have sedimentary rock in place. And you have metamorphic rock in place. And it was all a matter of um, filling in the blanks, uh, sometimes squares and sometimes mostly the arrows, the processes. So let's just start at igneous rocks and, um, well actually, let's start before igneous rocks. Let's start at magma. Where would we put magma on this table, this diagram? AG, yeah. So magma goes right there in that missing block between metamorphic and igneous. So in order to move from magma or lava to igneous rock, what do we have to do to that magma or lava? We have to cool it in what growth? Crystal. So crystallization would be what we're looking for at AC right there. So now you got igneous rock. Uh, you are also at the surface at this point. Remember I talked about this, this invisible dashed line that kind of cuts diagonally through there from like say 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock if this were a clock face. And anything to the right of that dashed line is a surface process. Anything to the left of that dashed line is a subsurface process. So we're at the surface now where weathering and erosion can do their thing. So A is weathering and erosion. Uh, what does weathering and erosion do to rocks? It creates what B is supposed to be. What does weathering and erosion make? Sediment. Good. And how convenient because we're going up to sedimentary rock. What did we just tell you is the process from sediment to sedimentary rock? Compaction and cementation. Exactly. Good. And then to go from a sedimentary rock to a metamorphical rock, what do you got to do to it? Heat and pressure. And remember, again, this is where we dive down to underneath the surface again. So heat and pressure gives us a metamorphic rock. There was a reason I gave you that silly video to watch. Hopefully that song was going through your head when you were trying to do the rock cycle. Metamorphic rock, to get to magma or lava, we simply need to continue melting. We go back to the remelt. Okay? So your processes are the arrows. Your objects are the squares or rectangles or cubes, whatever you want to call them. This guy ain't going away. If you didn't do so swell on it on this test, it is on the final. Okay? As is definition of rock and definition of the mineral. Geology class. We can't avoid that. Each of those was worth a point. We have our wonderful 
high def images of rocks, rock symbols, really. And we had some possible answers. One of those is limestone, one of those is just igneous, kind of generic, igneous rock, one is sandstone, and one is shale. Which one's which? So the bricks are limestone. Limestone breaks apart into, strangely, little things that look brickish. B with all the dots in it, yep, that is supposed to represent sand <laughs> grains. The dashes are supposed to represent the layering and the shale. And those lovely little tiki things or anarchy signs or whatever you think they look like are supposed to be asterisk usually. Those are the crystals signifying, again, just a generic igneous rock. There was a time when I apparently needed one more point to round up to an even number, 50. I like things to be out of 50. So, as just a brief bonus point, I created smiley face rock, which is E here. I'm known, if you've ever emailed me, I'm known for my smiley faces. So I thought it was a cute little joke. Well, one student had a uh, aunt or an uncle that was a geologist and she totally missed my joke and went home and talked to her aunt or uncle and oh my god what is this smiley face rock I've never seen this before I don't know it looked like toenails and sand and, and, and I didn't know if it was fossil if there's sandstone and, and I was like oh no 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 sorry so not everyone gets geology but I don't know anyway so yeah an E not an answer Molten mineral material elements at the surface of the earth are called lava, magma, magnesia, or lahar. I heard a word for lava back there. So yeah, at the surface we call it lava. The same stuff inside the earth, what do we call it, you guys? Magma. Beautiful. Do you guys like the fact that it only puts five questions on a page, or could you care less? You can just scroll through. I have that choice. In my brain, five questions at a time kind of seems like you're turning a page. Yeah. Okay. That was my thought. But if anyone is confused by having to hit the next page button or some variation on that, let me know. All right, so we're kind of belaboring the point, and, and I didn't mean to confuse you guys by putting so many questions more or less about the same stuff but I really wanted to, to make sure you got the connection between where this stuff cooled and what kind of rock it made and the crystals, because the crystals are really what tell us what type of rock it is and, and so on and so forth. So um, again, if we let lava, can't get both on the page at the same time. If you let lava solidify, uh, intrusive, extrusive, what is it? Extrusive. If you let magma solidify, intrusive, and then I think we've got the grain size questions coming up. All right, so the difference between intrusive and extrusive, no, we're not even to grain size yet, um, is where they crystallize. This second question came up, well, no, this question came up because a lot of people were really messing up the next question. And they didn't quite process that felsic and mafic was due not to where these suckers grew, but to what they were made out of. Felsic and mafic and intermediate, that's chemistry. That's the ingredients. Now, if this were a 14-week class on igneous rocks, which does exist, we would talk about the likelihood of one becoming, you know, more likely to become intrusive or extrusive and so, and so on and so forth, but we didn't go anywhere near that, all right? At this level, felsic and mafic tells you it's chemistry. Intrusive and extrusive simply tells you where it grew. So ways back there was the gentleman, Mr. Bowen, who
who sat there and watched lava cool, apparently, for some time and, and probably made some attempts at, uh, at magma in his lab. I think it was a long time ago, so it's probably hard to get the pressurization, but you never know. Um, and he realized a couple things. Uh, he realized that in magmar lava, certain minerals will always start to crystallize before other minerals. Uh, he also realized that in magmar lava, you have a fixed amount of ingredients. Okay, you can't pour in a bucket full of iron, right, to keep it, it going. I suppose you could really mess with it if you wanted to stand on the lava fields, but for all intents and purposes, it's a, it's a, closed, it's a closed system, right? So you have a certain amount of elemental ingredients, and once you use them up, you can't grow something that might need it that comes next. That's that whole reaction series. Remember Bowen's reaction series. Um, and that somehow, no matter what, these processes always occur. All right. So this was used to be an essay question back in the day. Please describe, um, you know, what what Bowen's reaction series tells us. That is how you get a lot of these all of the above sort of questions is when I was actually fishing for at some point, you know, you guys to tell me three things about it. So in this case, at any rate, this is one of those where I, I, I beg you, read all the answers because, yeah, the first one is true. And if you just circled an A and went on, but we're on test two now. You don't do that anymore. You learned on the first test, you read all the answers, right? All right. So anywho, all the above. Okay, yeah, I knew the grain size questions were coming. We're still beating this dying horse here. Okay, grain size associated with igneous rocks that cool inside. So intrusive igneous rocks have, I couldn't say that because it was a previous question, right? Intrusive igneous rocks have coarse, medium, fine, or mixed grains. Coarse, because they grow slower, and because they grow slower, they get to grow bigger. Grain size associated with igneous rocks that cool to surface. Those are those fine ones, the small ones. They cool very quickly. They don't have an opportunity to get very big. To go back to that uh, head of lettuce or cabbage that we talked about for cobbles, right? Think about if you just stopped its growth after one week versus if you let it grow for, say, a month. All right? That cabbage is going to get a lot bigger. Rocks that start to cool inside the earth and finish cooling outside. Okay, mixed. We talked about these. Uh, these were the porphyritic igneous rocks. I guess a surprising amount of people that go for medium, though, on this question. Okay. Starting to grow inside, you get those big crystals that grow first. Remember what Bowen said, something's got to start growing first. And then as the rest of this material exits, it all cools fine grain. So you get a mix of fine and coarse. This was that chocolate chip cookie rock. All right, now a handful of questions about igneous intrusions. Uh, the pool of magma that starts it all. Yeah, pluton, okay, or magma pool. But I didn't really want to even use that word again. So yeah, pluton is definitely a word we use. All right, so with the intrusions, remember we had concordant and discordant. We had dikes and sills. Concordant meant with the grain. Discordant meant clashing with, against the grain, so to speak. So which of these, layer, which of these layers, dikes or sills, uh, go with the rock layers? Okay, sills go with the rock layers. Good. Dikes cut across them. And there is that question right there. Okay, so discordant, cutting across, those are dikes. All right, uh, type of volcano that is characterized. So we're done with igneous rocks, finally. Type of volcano, moving on, that is characterized by gently sloping sides, mostly lava-type eruptions, not too horribly explosive, very large, and grows from the ocean floor upwards. What do we got? Cinder cone, composite cone, or shield cone? Hint, hermaphrodite is not a type of volcano. Shield, yes. All right. 
Type of volcano that is characterized by steeply sloping sides. Very explosive eruptions of mostly pyroclastic material. Somebody else help him out. He's been answering all these. Cinder, thank you. You see where I was going there with hermaphrodite. It is a composite of sorts, so that was my, my angle there. Uh, type of volcano that can erupt with either lavas or pyroclastic materials. They are quite large and they grow on the continents. So they're a mixture. So exactly. All right. Exactly. All right. Why is this word so? This question's really tiny. I don't know why. Hexagonal cylinders of rock formed from cooling lava inside a volcano. Columnar jointing. Yeah. And I apologize, I couldn't put the fancy little swoosh on Nue there. But uh, columnar jointing, good. Uh, lava formations made underwater resembling bean bags. La D or B? D. Ah, see, that's why we don't say letters. Yes, pillow basalts. Pillow basalts. Lava tubes are made underwater, but they're more like straws than pillows, or bean bags in this case. Super hot, fast moving, should probably be a hyphen in there. Cloud of gas and ash that rolls down the side of a volcano. I happen to be highlighting that one there. Nue ardente. Mud flow. Volcanic mud flow. Somebody else, what do we got here? Lahars, good, thank you. Uh, ooh, application level multiple choice. If you were able to find some lava tubes in an area, what would you be able to say about the environment in which they form? Yeah, I keep highlighting the answer. That's totally accidental. I'm sure you knew the answer, but it's weird that I just keep leaving the mouse on there. So yeah, remember lava tubes only form underwater, as far as we know. So when you find some lava tubes that are nowhere near water at the moment, you know that they had to have been, there had to have been water there when, when they formed. And because igneous rocks are so easy to get an accurate date on, you can, you can really start to reconstruct some environmental stuff. It's, it's cool stuff. Cool stuff. Another teeny tiny little question. Uh, two types of lava, both were basaltic. Uh, associated with Hawaiian island type eruptions, Bohoi Hoi and Aa. -ah. Uh, so, uh, which of these sentences is true about Bohoi Hoi and Aa? -ah? Uh, Bohoi Hoi is thin and runny, while Aa -ah is thick and chunky, or vice versa, or they're really just the same thing and they call them different things because, you know, we love to do that in geology. So, Bohoi Hoi is thick and chunky, while Aa -ah is thin and runny. Yeah, ah, uh ah, -uh, it's a very staccato sounding word. It's the it's the chunky stuff. Yeah, ah, uh ah -uh is oatmeal. Bohoi hoi is your maple syrup. Okay, what is the primary gas that comes out of a volcano? Water vapor. All that billowing clouds of smoke coming out is mostly just water vapor, steam. Everyone likes to call it. Uh, you collapse a volcano, you make a big old circular ring of cliffs, often filled with water. Caldera. Where do we usually find volcanoes? Well, yes, volcanoes usually are mountains, um, but not an answer option. Huh? Okay, so hot spots are the other place we find them. Arguably, um, and I kind of know where you're going with this one, arguably anywhere there is a volcano, there is a hot spot as well. Okay, because we're going to call it a hot spot because there's magma there, right? But what we're, what we're looking for here is the plate boundaries. They tend to cluster along your plate boundaries. Remember, we talked about the ring of fire, okay? Bless you talked about the ring of fire, but right there in the middle of that Pacific plate, which is totally rimmed by volcanoes, we happen to have the Hawaiian Islands, just as one out of many examples. All right, The Hawaiian Islands are nowhere near that plate boundary. They have their own unique hotspot. So 
we're looking for here most volcanoes, and that's the word most is actually really the importantest part there. Uh, so seams in the lithosphere, all right? Um, but the next question, unlike most volcanoes, the Hawaiian Islands, okay, they're different. Uh, that is hot spot activity. And that is just for some random reason, uh, a, a plume of, of magma came up from in the mantle, worked its way into the crust, and um, it's fueling volcanoes. So that is, I don't want to say the oddity, but that is definitely, you know, a distant second to the other way. All right, the Hawaiian Islands are which of the three types of volcanoes? Yep, the ones that start on the ocean floor and grow up. You're literally seeing just the tip of the iceberg with, with the Hawaiian Islands. Oh, well, by the way, did you see uh, in the news maybe Iceland is erupting? Uh, another example of that. Uh, that is on a plate boundary, though, Iceland. Um, the whole dang thing is a uh, couple of volcanoes, really. But uh, they are currently uh, erupting. So... All right, active chain of volcanoes in the continental U.S. of A. Smokies is a good wrong answer, isn't it? You'd think volcanoes would smoke. Smokies are actually on the east coast, though. It is the Cascade Range. Yeah, the fog, the mist, the haze. Yeah, it is. And I have driven through there at night. You do not want to do that. Um, this Blue Ridge Parkway, it's a beautiful scenic byway up there. Uh, before you get down in the hollows. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. That and probably the steel mills, too, back in the day. <laughs> Those are gone. But, yeah, no, it was always, it's a type of environment that, that makes a lot of fog, for sure. So the Cascades, beautiful. Uh, the Cascades are part of the Ring of Fire, or the Circum Pacific Belt, okay, uh, which is the next question. Um, but for those of you really just denying this whole thing, I gave you, you know, some options for denying it completely. Um, so the most active area, as we just said, is the Pacific Ocean. How about second most active? That, that is your circum-Mediterranean belt, okay? Uh, and again, that's where all of your uh, village obliterating volcanoes uh, from back in the day were at. Killing all those people in Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, Mount St. Helens, part of the Cascade Range. Um, this is a uh, composite, okay? This is a composite. Hopefully you didn't miss this one. It was kind of a, a sleeper question there. Um, hopefully you knew St. Helens was in the Cascade Range, and you had previously told me that the uh, Cascades uh, were composites. So hopefully you put two and two together there. Mount St. Helens was the 80s, the 80s. All right, fissure eruption. You guys remember me talking about fissure eruptions? I said not always do you make these giant mountains, okay, but sometimes the earth just cracks open and bleeds, right? Um, and those are some pretty picturesque things. Hollywood likes to show us those as much as they like to show big pointy mountains blowing up. But there's something special about the earth cracking open and, and fire and brimstone coming out like the gates of hell, right? Um, so that is a fissure eruption. All right. I put it in italics, decreasing. If I could have made it blink at you or highlighted it, I don't think I could highlight it. But um, hopefully you, you knew, and those of you that were here could have come up and asked me, um, we mean from biggest to smallest, okay? And I do provide you with both because every so often I, I change the italicized word. This semester it was decreasing. So we want to start with the biggest, all right, which is block and bomb, cinder, and ash. And I, I don't know if it was in the days before PowerPoint, but I uh, was talking about these one day, and I said block, bomb, cinder, ash. And somebody in the back row, it was in a lecture hall, it was that long ago. They're like, did you say bong? Like, no, that is not where bongs come from. 
obviously talking to a bong before class that morning. I don't know what they were up to. But um, so bomb with a B. All right, the source of the volcano. So now we're on our volcano anatomy here. And again, like these series questions, you're going to use up all of your answers here in a moment. Uh, but the first one we need to get rid of is what? The magma chamber. Good. Probably should call that a lava chamber now, but it's still underground. So that's, you know, I think that's why they go with that. Uh, the pipeworks that leads up to and eventually builds that lovely cone. That's the vent or the vent pipes. Good. Uh, the mountain itself, we call the cone, which only leaves the what at the top? The crater. Good. Good, good, good. All right. And that was 42 questions for, I think, darn near 50 points. You had two points for the definition question, uh, even though you weren't writing anything. And then the rock cycle had multiple points as well. So uh, on a 50-point quiz, I know that the silly computer tells you probably what you get anymore. But on a 50-point test, um, five you could miss, five points and still get, a, uh, get an A, 10 points to get a B, 15 for a C. All right. So, and like I said, test three is coming up before you know it.